through today a talk um, summarizing a little bit about my experiences about creating world-class and world-leading environments and, and initiatives. And, and the big question is how you get there. And that's essentially what I'm, what I'm going to talk about today. And I will also use the establishment of AI Sweden as one case study for that. Um, when I worked out outside Sweden for several years, came back here, and I got a question from the automotive industry in Gothenburg. Can you do something about the AI ecosystem in Sweden, which is not performing at the level we needed here to develop advanced autonomous speakers, like, for example, Thomas, and what the Volvo Car Group is doing, and many others. We could see that our research environment, our production of ideas, our production of engineers was not compatible to what we could see in other countries. Here is some data that I got back in. I had KTH do a bibliometric search. And what you can see here is the number of publications in deep learning per year. You can see that it wasn't going on too much until 2012. And so it came out from Baguio and so forth, and then picked up here afterwards. And here you have China taking off with about 600 per year US, and then sort of big countries, a big jump down to other countries. And if you increase the magnification on the sort of smaller countries, you get what you have here. And at the top here is 90. So here you're starting with Japan, UK, and on and on. Sweden is the second to lowest. That's where we were at. And you can see two major issues here. One is that we're far down. And number two is that our ecosystem had not kicked in. We did not see this exponential growth that you could see in other countries. And the question and challenge I got is, OK, how do we catch up and fix this? So that essentially was when I started thinking about how do we run faster here? How do we create an ecosystem here to not only catch up, but to, to run faster? And we can't just copy what they do, because if you do, we will have the same curve, but we'll be here. We will always be trading. So the question is, how do we get a steeper curve than what's done in other countries? So we can't just copy and paste. That was sort of the background. I often use this model, and I want to transmit that to you guys here, of how to develop performance. And what you can see here is a typical S-curve. This paper here is actually from 1948. So they were already looking at it then. It's still true. It's a good thing with engineering is that many things that you do in engineering are true over time. If you go into social science and other things, they tend to change. Whereas the laws of nature and things like that are pretty stable. Now, <clears throat> performance here it sort of starts off somewhere low, and at some point it picks up and then it goes on. And they try to explain here uh, why that is, and, and also look at how many inventions are, are produced. And inventions. It's not only patents, but it's new ideas and sort of building on. And you can see in the beginning, only a few people work on it. And then as it becomes more mainstream, performer comes up, the number of inventions pick up as well. And the level of inventions at the very beginning here is very high. Somebody invents, let's say, deep learning, or somebody invents autonomous uh, trucks, for example. Now, that's a huge big thing. And then you have to go in and start fixing all the bugs you find, or all the issues you have, all the challenges. And then you have some Thing you have to overcome, whatever it might be. You sort of try to improve and improve, you just won't turn the corner. <laughs> and then at this point, you solve that problem. It's a pretty high level inversion, and then it's just fixing it from that. So the, the money, here you have to spend a lot of money, the typical research. Somewhere when it picks up, that's when people start buying it, that's when you kind of get, get return on your investment. So that's a good mindset to have. And if you look at it, if you want to be famous, you want to be back here. That's when you are the inventor of whatever it was. If you want to be rich, you kind of want to be here, where the cash flow comes in. But if you want to be rich and famous, you want to be right here. You solve the sort of fundamental issue and start to grow. But to be there, you need to be fast. It's all about speed. I think that was your point, too. You need to really get into it fast and identify what is this problem, solve it. And then once you run up this curve, you have to run faster than everybody else to keep world leadership and world class. So that is the challenge that. If you're a national ecosystem or if you're a company, it doesn't matter. It's the same challenge. And to illustrate this with a point, these are some of these S curves for something. And uh, you might start guessing about what this is. But you can see at 1910, this is the time here. So in 1910, performance was at 1.95. And then you know something happened and whatnot. And then all of a sudden, something else happened. And then, yeah, now we're around 2.45. So the question, if you look at a thing like this or history like this, where are the S curves? It turns out to be here. So here was one invention, and somebody invented whatever it was here, came up with performance, and then it was just a lot of these improvements. 
Then somebody figured out a better way to do it. Jumped a little bit and came all the way up here. This here sort of flattened out here. It couldn't be done much better using this particular technique. Whereas this one, we go from here all the way to here, but it stopped there. And then you can know, see this way. Now to show you what this is about, it's high jumping. So you can see here in the very beginning, somebody invented a rolling technique. So it could be a method, it could be a technology. And then, you know, at some point they figured out the straddle here, and then came here, and then they figured out flop, which took them to the next one. So you can see how once you solve the fundamental problem, you then need to get into the nitty gritty and really improving as fast. And the one who improves the fastest are the ones who are the world leaders. But so you can be the one who invents the, the straddle here. But if you aren't fast enough to, pick, to, to keep up, you're not going to be the world leader. So that's kind of the, the match you have to think of. You know, who are you and what staff do you have? And, and for you, Thomas, for example, as you were pointing out, you, know, you might have some good people to take this step. Now you need another 250 to, to do this running here. And it's not necessarily the same people. So it's all about speed. It's speed to invent that step. And if you're not the inventor, it's speed to understand it and then improve on it. So. The question I pose to myself then when challenged with this, what to do about the AI system here is, you know, is there a sweet spot for our AI ecosystem? What is this point here that we can do? Is there something that's going on that we can invent here and then run like crazy? So that is what AI Sweden is about. The original idea for AI Sweden that I had posted in, in 2017 um, and I went into the, the government here to the minister, yeah, Peter Eriksson was the digitalisering minister at that time. So he asked me, you know, everybody keeps telling me you need to do something, but he said, but I don't know what. And I said, well, you know, here's what we need to do. So we need to not only do what other countries do, which is a research center in AI, <clears throat> where do you do the algorithm research and you use public data sets and all these things. What we should do is also add a, a national data factory. Because if we do that, we have people who not only deal with the algorithmic deal, uh, uh, research and work, but also people who can work on the data and they need to work like a system. So it's kind of like, I explained it like CERN in Switzerland with the uh, physics, the particle physics. You have the physicists working on the experiments they want to do, and then you have the engineers who, who have to build the accelerator and the detector. And when the and physicist comes to the engineers, the engineers will say, well, you know, we can or we cannot do this. How about if you change it slightly? And that is what we were after. And if we could get this to run, we figured that we can run faster than everybody else and have a quicker gradient on our curve than they have in other countries who only have that. So this is kind of the way you set AI Sweden up. It's kind of like running a 400 meter race, but backwards. So starting here, and then we would go, we, because there's no way we can catch up with China and US and these other guys who are way ahead. We just can't do it. So why, why even waste the time? So we run backwards. And then we'll meet these other guys and they'll see us running way faster, but in the other direction. Some of them will you know, join us and go backwards. So, so they have that mindset, and that's how I think about stuff. So looking further into the data factory, because nobody had data factories, I couldn't go out and say, I want to do a data factory like that country. There was no such thing. Uh, so I looked at data factories from this escort. So you can see I'm a little bit in love with the escorts here, but it helps to for me to understand what I'm looking at. So the Data factory as a system is at an infancy stage. And what characterizes infancy is that there's a lot of radical innovation going on. The companies are exploring all sorts of, of uh, alternative concepts. It could be like cloud, like what you guys are doing at Google. It can be on-premises, like what we are doing here in Gothenburg, and it can be hybrid, and who knows what. But we're still down here. And as you can see, if we want to be rich and famous, this is the place. So we figured, OK, well, let's go there and then see what we can do. So the way we set up the whole AI Sweden <laughs> is a philosophy of investing together and sharing with many. So looking at what makes things slow, and I can tell you that making things slow is uh, between engineers and lawyers, but I don't tell them. But <clears throat> so what you do then is you set up a system that don't need lawyers. So what we don't do, we don't sign any NDAs. We don't sign any IP agreements, and we don't sign any special memberships. And people think we're slightly crazy for a start. But then they figure out that this is actually the way to do it, to get started quickly, to make this first invention, the higher level invention, 
we are way better off to understand that quickly and then bring it home and then do the application in our own system at home. I was a long time ago um, working at MIT for many, many years. I was part of the International Motor Vehicle Program. And at the time, uh, it was started by the US automotive industry, who <clears throat> was challenged by the Japanese, who said, well, and, and the, the point was that they had better quality and they had lower manufacturing costs. And that's not a good place to compete uh, if you have competitors who have that. So the US auto industry got together to figure out lead principles and quality techniques. And then once they learn that together, they'll take it home and apply it in their own uh, business. So this is what we do here. We have here, we've learned that it's not only for automotive, it's health, the hospitals, it's the automotive, the banks, and it's the um, it's whole, whole bunch of industry who actually benefit from getting in here, working out these fundamental issues together, sharing between us how you do it in automotive, how you do it in health, and so forth. Okay, you've got a good idea. Okay, let's bring that back. You bring it back home, and then you have your own. IP and so forth. But we're so much faster doing it here without all these agreements that, that it actually beats it. So companies who want to compete on speed, they join. People who don't have a hurry, that they don't need to join. That's fine. The model we have is a gym. So we don't sell anything. We, we have fantastic equipment. We have personal trainers. We have space. And companies pay a membership fee. And that enables them to send in their people to the gym. And the more they come and the more they work out, the stronger they get. That's kind of the model. <clears throat> so many times it's fun to work out with friends. Same idea here. And I can't build your strength. So many of the fundamental research institutes that I've looked at many over time is that they sell services, you know, and I'll work out a problem. Here it is. It doesn't teach you much. It gives you a solution, but you haven't built any of your strength that way. So we set up to build your strength here. We don't charge for it. <clears throat> And we have also set a goal for ourselves. And that goal is that anybody should be able from anywhere to start a project here in two hours. We have now 117 gym members. These are the ones here. Some are big here. We have some small. We have public sector. We have academia. And it's working. It's, it's happening, what I'm talking about. And, and one of the things that I'm going to do as a case study now toward so the rest of this talk here is just looking at the data factory. So we looked at automotive, what we are doing there. And right now, for complete transparency, um, I am normally head of research at, at Santact, but I'm on leave right now to, to do this here. So, so I'm, <clears throat> I have some affiliation with Santact as I'm also trying to show by my jacket here, so there's no doubt about that. But <clears throat> my job is at AI Suite in the building, what you can see. But anyway, this is how you do it for traditional training in AI. You, you collect a ton of data. You have a huge amount of data. You have to ship it back home to your center. We have such centers. Then you pick some of that data, you annotate it. You take some of that annotated by a huge, big, expensive computer. They cost this particular one is the one that's academic in Sweden. It costs almost half a billion kroner, so almost 500 million kroner for this one installation at Linköping University. And for your information, we have better stuff here in Gothenburg. So, but <clears throat> I can't tell you what they cost. So, and then using that, you can train your cool. Networks. So that's how you do it. Right? Now, so is there a problem with this? This is the data factory. Why not just keep improving this? And that is what a lot of companies do. They keep improving this chain. But that's kind of the breakthrough. And then you go down to the bottom. The question is, what's the next hump here? And to figure that out for our ecosystem, we said, well, let's build something that complements what everybody else is doing. And that is valuable both for us who want to use it in automotive or health, but also for the companies who build and provide it, like Google, like Microsoft, like Dell. HP and others. And if we can get them to work together and figure this out, well, that might be even better. So we said that AI Suite is a place where engineers work together, no salespeople and no procurement people. You run up to a demonstration unit, then you go commercial. And that's where you introduce your sales guys and your, your procurement people. We have in the data factory, we put in a small training environment. One of these computers is over there, way smaller, good enough for us. But then we have some knowledge sharing community, but when, then we said, this is something that we should do that nobody else has. We should be the test bed for data factories. So not only do we have that, but we have to play it where we go and, and figure it out. So the first thing that we did is a few small things, but the, the, the biggest thing we have right now is what I'm going to show you now to conclude this, is um, our edge lab. And the, 
The problem we had was that the current solution, the current sort of big solutions, is not sustainable. It's from like what you were pointing out here, George, it's not sustainable environmentally, it's not sustainable cost-wise. It doesn't necessarily comply with all the emerging regulations, like what you were saying, the legislation is changing all the time. There's a whole bunch of issues here. So we said, this is not going to work. Hospitals can't share data. We can't share data between China and Europe. They prevent you from sending that data from China to here. We can't send our data there because of GDPR. So how do you train a vehicle that can run on both and so forth? So huge amount of issues here. So that was the problem. And if you could make it more crisp, what we want is essentially what you see here. We want more data and less data. It's too expensive. We want to share data and keep it private. And we want to transfer the data, but we have to keep it local. In Sweden, we have a word that's logon. So if you were Swedish, you would say more data, less data. That sounds like logon data, but it doesn't work. Logon data does not solve our problem. We need both of them. How to solve that? So these are paradoxes. And it's really cool to go and solve paradoxes. The hardest thing about a paradox is to stay it, to stay the problem like the paradox. But if you do, you can reformulate your fundamental questions like this here. Uh, if you create data on the edge, why don't you keep it there? Why do you even bother moving it? And if you say you want to aggregate all this data in one place, why don't we just aggregate the knowledge and forget about all this data? That would be a cool thing to do. So um, thanks to Google again. A uh, good paper was published in 2016 called Federated Learning. Uh, it's more or less works the following way that you take an algorithm, an empty algorithm, transfer it out to your devices that collects the data, let them each train locally, but then you ship back the model parameters and you uh, federate them. And then you can ship it out again and train them and so forth. You can do all sorts of cool stuff with it. You can see that, right? We do that all the time, every day. You can also do this, which is the second part. Uh, we, you get rid of that central computer. If you have good enough compute in your devices, you do the federation in one of them. They call that swarm learning. So that we are looking at both of them. When do you use one? When do you use the other? When do you, when do you how does it scale and so forth? But it's easy to understand the idea, but it's hard to how you actually do it. So we get the Apps Lab, it's here in Gothenburg. It's now got stuff for 35 million kroner in it. It's all donated. Why? Because it takes me way too much time to write application money and then to do a procurement process and then to appoint a winner and then take care of the guys who lose and then install it. So what we did is we said to the members, well, you know, if you want your stuff in here, give it to us. And they first thought we were crazy, and then some companies did it. And once a few companies did it, the others could not do it because they wouldn't be able to be outside. So these were the guys who first gave us the stuff. And as I said, we now have stuff for 35 million SDK in here. And some of these companies, they said, well, we just shrink back what we have here at home. We just ship it to you. So it took three days. Just imagine what it would take me to apply for 10 million SDK, get that money, do a procurement process, and get it installed. That's a year, easily. And we did it in three days. So. <clears throat> We have in here some really cool stuff, including Google Corrals, but we also have other stuff. NVIDIA, we have ADX Caviers, and we have the whole edge line from HP. We have the NetApps, all the stuff they have. And we have the environments from uh, HP and from uh, Microsoft and from uh, Google and everything else. And so it's really quite good. Uh, we got some really good press for it when we opened it. And here is when you come into how do you know if you have world class or world leading? Well, world leading is when other people tell you you have it. It's not when your market department tells you but it's when other people said it. That's a good indicator. So we have that. And we can do all this. We can test all of this and compute plans and explore scalability and whatnot. It's like a Lego block, so we can connect together. We have 5G in there, white box. We have all these different devices. And we can experiment really fast. And you can learn how to build. You can learn tools. You can learn the use cases, figure out security issues. And also, you might have to consider in your next product, how do you need to equip that in order to perform edge learning if, if that's what you're after. And for the people who create the hardware, for them, this is a unique pre-launch pad for their new product. So that's why they want to work together with the users here. And so far, we've built the lab. We've solved the cross-border problem for, for China and Europe. So they are investing in that now on the automotive side here in, in Gothenburg. We have, on the academic side, a couple of international big schools working out some, some more academic research problems, done some demos. We did a really cool thing. Somebody says, does this apply in space? So we did a space hackathon. We set that up in about a month. We had people from Australia, India, Russia, five countries here, and three states in the US. And they came up with an answer. And that resulted in the European Space Agency calling us the day after, saying, wow, you guys got this. We want to designate this as a 
at PyLab X, they call it, which is a European top lab in edge learning. And they said, strategically, you should get edge learning for space. And that's why we're, so that took a day for them to do, which I thought was pretty good to see. So summary wise, we have a world class lab. I can say that with pretty good confidence. Now, the challenge we put to ourselves is how do you go from world class to world leadership? And you can make an analogy here with a film studio. You can have a really cool film studio with cameras and lights and everything else. It doesn't make you into Hollywood. So how do you make yourself into Hollywood for Edge Lab? That's sort of the challenge. You need a culture, you need people to come in, you need them to sort of create the new cool manuscripts, you need the actors to, to want to come here and do it here. And, and that is what we're working on right now. To have a world-class film studio is a prerequisite. If you do this, we can run much faster than everybody else. So we have, we are forming a consortium on this, uh, we have a budget of about 250 to 300 million over four years. Um, about half is in kind equipment that people give us and also time. Uh, as I said, many companies are now sending their engineer team to come in and, and work out in our gym. So instead of hiring a lot of people, people just send them to us for free, which is really good. So, <laughs> but it's good for them too. That's why they do it. So, so we get more of in kind and now we have <laughs> one coming in this way too. And we have, Five big or four big international universities joining now, um, and the European Space Agency. And we're doing some really cool stuff on the data sets too now. Yeah, there's a lot of issues, as I indicated early on, with legislation, and that prevents us from um, using a lot of GDPR protected privacy data. So we figured out that the agriculture university in Sweden is the secret source here. You don't need street or road data. We saw the same problem using seabirds. And that I can give access to for anybody in Tua. We had no idea this was a good data set, but we had some really clever people. We were doing something with agriculture guys, and then somebody said, well, you know, we can do this to test all the different setups and stuff for automotive, and it worked. So now we're doing this with the SLU here for pretty much everything um, as much as we can. We will now, instead of using patient data from hospitals, guess what? Pigs are good too. <clears throat> and then if you, if you want to go in, into uh, to space, you know, there was something on the Muppet Show way back called Pigs in Space. So who knows where this is going to take it. Uh, point is, speed, it's all about speed. I mean, I'm competitive as hell as you could probably imagine. And um, boldness, be brave. You know, and don't take a note. If it doesn't work, well, just do something else. And then the key here is data, figuring out how to set up experiments and then sharing it. And if you share, you learn and you'll be even faster. So that people are getting comfortable with that now. And it's sort of going away now from the standard computer to edge instead. And it's edge training, it's not edge AI. Edge AI is a model you train somewhere else and you just deploy it. This is training the actual model on the edge. So in summary, speed is the thing. We said that the goal is that you should be able to explore in two hours or less. And that's why we use animal data. That's why we set it up the way we do. <clears throat> Transfer knowledge is way faster in people than in a paper. Special agreements take too much time. Try to avoid money because you have to write tons of reports and applications and stuff. You need some money, obviously, but the less the better. Kind of the answer there. And, and be unconventional and go big. It takes equally much time to apply for a small project and report that as it takes for a big project. And you can do a lot more in a big project. And the strategy I have to set up, to set up sort of direction, you need quite a strong element of knowledge to understand what's going on. You need to be pretty bold and think outside the box. Don't just you know, improve uh, to set up something like this. And once you get in place, the most important thing, you, you do have some constraints. You can't run completely wild. Safety is sort of number one. We can never do something that's unsafe. Ethics is also critically important. If we are doing unethical things, it will come back and bite us really quick, and we will not be able to continue. And Quality and the quality is not gold plating, but good enough quality to show. So don't go out and over promise stuff that say, you know, we're still experimenting, we don't know this stuff, here's where we're at. If you're transparent on that, then people expect exactly that. They're, they're happy. If you're overselling it and that you only deliver something less, then people are pretty unhappy. So that was the show for today. So.